we're moving into talking more about uh, the other receptors of the adaptive immune response. And while just like with the B cell receptors or antibodies, whichever you want to call them, they have a lot of homology, not only in their structures, but also in their function. They have antigen binding sites. They both bind to antigens. The difference being that one is soluble and the other is uh, in the insoluble form. They have a variable region. They have carbohydrates attached to them. They are really, really similar. Um, one of the things you may want to take note of here, and I like this, this diagram for using the color coordination, is that there's an alpha chain and then there's also a beta chain. And the beta chain is homologous, homologous genetically to that of the uh, heavy chains in the antibodies, and the alpha chain is homologous to that of the light chain in the antibody. Okay. So when we talked about all the different BCR, B cell receptor mechanism diversity, all those still apply to things that take place in T cells. The only thing that doesn't happen is in T cells, there's no somatic hypermutation. There is no hypermutation taking place in the T cell receptors. But all the other stuff, junctional diversity, somatic recombination, splicing mechanisms, those are happening here. But what you'll notice here, especially, which is I like this picture here, for the alpha chain locus, and then if we can see for the B, so for beta, there are D segments here, because beta is homologous to the heavy chain, and then alpha is homologous to the light chain, so there's just a V and then there's a J regions, but what you may have noticed is that there's a lot more uh, segments of, of genes that they can choose from, and so there's, a, generally speaking, going to be more variation in T cell structure than there is in B cell receptor structures, which is what this diagram here is talking about. So let's just look at, at the overall comparison between them. So variable segments, a lot more in the uh, alpha and beta T cell receptors than, which is what we just shown in the past diagram, than that of immunoglobulins. Diversity segments, though, the D segments in the heavy chain, there's a little bit more than there is that of the beta. Obviously, there isn't any in the alpha because it's homologous to the light chain. Um, D segments being read in three frames. This is very rarely done here, but we'll, we'll talk about this later with B cell uh, B chains having D segments read in three frames. Joining segments, though. 61 joining segments, uh, as opposed to, you know, five or four for kappa or versus lambda, for, for around the average of four and a half individually. Uh, joints with N and P nucleotides, so junctional diversity. Two here, 50% uh, of those of the kappa and lambda, two and one. Um, this is just, I guess, the, the two things that I really wanted to point though is that the total diversity for an immunoglobulin is pretty darn large, and these are all just approximation numbers. I always expect it to be larger than what it is, but for <laughs> it's it's five orders of magnitude greater uh, in terms of variation than that of the immunoglobulin. So let's let's talk about what this structure really looks like. So. Here we see a T cell receptor. There's the antigen recognition site, the antigen binding site here. There's the alpha and beta chains. And so just how when we talked about with immunoglobulins having the IgA and IgD uh, parts that are there that are helping them out with that, there's CD3 molecules here which have similar functions. So what are these guys doing? Well, these are going to help with signaling. But one of the things that you may want to take note of is that this is a little bit more complex than that of like the B cell receptor where it just has that one molecule. In this place we have whole things known as CD3 T cell receptor complexes here. So the, say an antigen is going to bind from here, it's going to cause a conformational change which is going to act not only on CD3 but also on these, um, I believe that's zeta subunits as well. And so there's a wider there's more things taking place. There's more molecules that are involved in signaling of a T cell receptor. And if there's more stuff in, in the process between getting to the T cell receptor and then the activation that we have in the nucleus, that just means that there's more precision and more fine tuning. So this is a more, more precise signaling. And I hope you're able to see that, just how like if we have a long axis here, well the longer the axis, the more precise it is. The more things involved in signaling, the more we can fine tune and control that signaling. And that's, that's why I think that they have these here. If you're curious as to how I remember this, remember that E and D come in the alphabet before G and E do. And so they would be on the A side as opposed to the B side. I don't think it's really important that you know which is on which side so much as you understand the functions of these things. This whole thing here, uh, as a whole, this whole thing here is known as the CD3 
T-cell complex. All right, handwriting's bad, but anyways. Um, so a distinct population of T-cells express another type of, of T-cell receptors known as gamma and delta chains. And we really don't fully understand the function of these. These tend to be a little bit uh, more conserved, more conserved than that of what we see with the alpha and beta. But these are really uh, prevalent in, in the tissue spaces, predominantly the skin. But as far as actually circulating the bloodstream goes and circulating the lymphatic ducts, that is more or less something of alpha and beta. They have very different functions and they have much less variability because they're more conserved. I'm guessing that they have less variability in terms of their structure because of the environments that they consist in. Um, those are a bit more harsh. So there's two uh, things that this is made out of, the beta chains and then the alpha chains. And these guys have homology to that of the B cell receptors. So I want you to think of the beta chains are homologous to that of the heavy chain. Whereas with the alpha chains, these are homologous to the light chains. So just how we had talked about earlier with the structures of these, there's two parts of the beta chain and there's two, the two parts of the alpha chain. There's the C terminus and then the N terminus. And I'm going to do that in white and you'll understand why I'm drawing these in white. The C terminus, obviously, as you can imagine, C, carboxy, constant, conserved. That's the way that I remember that. It's the three C's. So this is going to be the constant domain. There's only two C genes in this. Now, I didn't mention this up here, but with the uh, heavy chain, just like before, there are the V segments, the J segments, and the D segments that all play a role in giving the recombination process the various structures. This overall size of the genomes for each and every one of the, or this overall size of the genetic structure for each and every one of these is larger than that of the B cells. So obviously if we have a larger amount of genes to pick from, we're going to have larger amounts of variation. Okay, so the N-terminus, just like when we talked about the B cell receptors or the immunoglobulins, the N-terminus contributes to that of the, the variable domains. These variable domains have, of course, obviously the antigen binding sites associated with them, and underneath those anti in the antigen binding sites, there are just the same three hypervariable loops for each and every one of these. So this applies not only to the beta chains, but also to the alpha chains, which is why I circled them in white, because I didn't want to write the same thing twice. So they each have their own uh, variable domains, and they each have the three hypervariable loops. This is all review, essentially, just uh, you didn't know it, because we didn't mention it when we talked about B cells. Just like with the, the beta chains, there's the C terminus. Remember, C carboxy constant conserved. It's going to make the assumption that since we knew that this was analogous to this, there's just the, or homologous to this, sorry, the V and then the J segments for this, and also it is larger than that of the B cells. I'm not really going to stress that too much, though. So both the beta and the alpha chains are come together to make up the T cell receptor. But when these guys interact with um, the CD3 molecules, CD3 molecules, we end up getting this thing known as a T, I'm just going to abbreviate that this is TCR CD3 complex. And it's that little diagram that shows all three of them kind of huddled together. This consists of the CD3 molecules Upsilon, Gamma, Delta, and uh, another Epsilon. <laughs> Alpha for those two, and then Beta for the other two as well. Um, so there's also a part of the CD3 complex. So these guys all over here are kind of located more in close proximity to them. The other one, though, that does also play a role in this is the... I believe this is called kappa chain. I'm going to try to draw it. And if you're a Greek person, I am sorry because I'm probably butchering this alphabet for you. I think that's supposed to be kappa. <laughs> it looks like kappa. Anyways, so both of these things come, come into play there. They are both uh, play a role in signaling and transport. And I guess I should have been more specific in what I'm saying. Okay, so signaling, we're talking about the signal transduction pathway um, that we're having here for the... the transport part, I meant to say that there's directing the T-cell receptors to the membrane um, and to where they'll be embedded into there as a function of things. Um, if we were to go ahead and keep playing our little homologous games here, these are homologous to Ig, Alpha, and Beta. Alpha and Ig, Beta. Remember those guys from the B-cells? So that's where that homology is from.